As many of you know, the Institute of Public Administration Canada, or IPAC, convenes speakers and hosts events to support capacity building and learning opportunities for our keen public servants. With all the recent tensions surrounding the global pandemic and the shaky transition of power in the United States, we wanted our next event to be both highly informative, as is the norm, but also fun and lighthearted. The perfect opportunity has presented itself with this year being the 40th anniversary of the British sitcom Yes Minister, a show which has remarkably well captured uh, this balance of humor and insightfulness that we've been seeking. The show follows the travails of Minister Jim Hacker and his permanent secretary, or deputy minister as we'd call them in Canada, Sir Humphrey Appleby, as they navigate the issues of statecraft and the issues facing their government. The scenes from Yes Minister have not only consistently proven a source of levity for all these years, but have since been woven into academic texts and common public service lore the world over, uh, due in large part to the series' alacrity in describing the dynamics and the decision-making at the core of the public administration. Tonight, we at IPAC National Capital Region are pleased to be making our own contribution to the lore surrounding Yes Minister by putting the series to the test. We've assembled three former ministers and three high-ranking officials from different backgrounds, regions, and party affiliations to comment on clips from the series. Now, each of these individuals has separately watched the same seven segments from the show and has been asked to speak to the extent that these segments represent the truth or what their experience was from actually having been in similar situations in the real world. As the interviewer and editor of this compilation, I've seen the clips and the responses many times over, and I find them to be both extremely fun as well as enlightening. Altogether, the content that you're going to see tonight offers an earnest and candid perspective on that key point where political and administrative authority intersect. I personally went about this event as an enthusiastic fan of the show, hoping to share my love for the series with others, um, but was frankly pleased and surprised to see how much I also learned along the way. I hope that you share this type of experience uh, from our series tonight. Now, before introducing you to our speakers, we have special introductions available tonight from Suzanne Lajeune d'Algirchek, who is the High Commissioner of the United Kingdom to Canada and also a fan of the show. Hello, I'm Susan Lejeune d'Algazek, I'm the British High Commissioner to Canada and I'm delighted to talk to you today and give a brief introduction to Yes Minister and Yes Prime Minister, undoubtedly one of the best comedy series that's ever been produced in the UK. It's presented as fiction, but is it fiction? I think that's what you're here to talk about. I would suggest that it's probably a bit more like scripted reality, more like the Kardashians perhaps, than a fictional series, um, obviously not in the people. Um, but the decor, the props, the language, everything about it is incredibly authentic. One of the things that comes through the whole series is a slight tension between Number 10 and the Prime Minister and the Foreign Office. And I can attest to the fact that that has, at times in my career, been absolutely true. We've overcome it in past years and recent years by having one of our own people as Cabinet Secretary, Lord Sedwell. Um, but it's true that uh, the Foreign Office does not always enjoy smooth, harmonious relations with the rest, with number 10. Um, at one point in the series, uh, the Prime Minister says, I'm talking about what's right and wrong. Uh, and his Cabinet Secretary says, for God's sake, don't let the FCO hear you saying that. And at another point, um, he says, uh, talking about a foreign policy uh, issue, what appalling cynicism, Humphrey. And Humphrey replies, we call that diplomacy, Prime Minister. Um, what is complete fiction, of course, is the competence or otherwise of the British Civil Service. Um, uh, one of my favourite quotes, which is quite clearly fiction, if they once accepted the principle that senior civil servants could be removed for incompetence, that would be the thin end of the wedge. We could lose dozens of our chaps, hundreds even, and Sir Humphrey says, thousands. Another thing I think which is very clear and true and, and authentic is the relationship between government and the press. Um, I particularly like the quote which goes, here's an example of an irregular verb. I give confidential press briefings. You leak. He's being charged under the Official Secrets Act. Another nice one, never believe anything in politics until it's been officially denied. Um, finally, uh, a running theme uh, on the foreign policy side is our relationship with our closest neighbour, France. Um, you will pick up, if you, really, if, you, if you watch the whole series, that our nuclear deterrent is actually to deter the French. Um, and at one point, the Prime Minister asks Sir Humphrey, don't we ever get our own way with the French? Well, sometimes, says Sir Humphrey. 
when was the last, when was the last time? Waterloo, 1850. Um, and finally, uh, to conclude on the civil service, um, the Prime Minister says, if there were a conflict of interest, which side would the civil service be on? And his private secretary Bernard replies, the winning side, Prime Minister. But joking aside, I think what the series does is show what's great about both the British and the Canadian civil services. So an impartial, professional, committed sense of public service, serving the government of the day as best it can. Those values remain. Um, they have been sorely tested in the last eight months, where the pandemic has really stretched the bounds of what the public service has been asked to do and what it's been asked to deliver. I think both here and in the UK, we have shown flexibility, agility, and huge resilience to serve our citizens and to try and cope with the huge challenge of COVID-19. The pandemic has also underlined for me the closeness of the relationship we have with Canada. It has been so easy to work with our counterparts here in Ottawa and in the provinces on learning from each other, on providing support and advice when we need it. And uh, at the same time, not to lose sight of the uh, challenges that are still going on, on in foreign policy across the world. We instinctively understand each other and our machines work naturally together. Um, we even have institutions on both sides which have been inspired by the way in which uh, you or we have tackled a particular thing, the most obvious recent one being your National Cyber uh, Security Centre, which is modelled very closely on the UK one. So uh, to sum up, uh, this relationship uh, is a very, very close one. Uh, it's got even closer over the last eight months and uh, I can't think of a better place to have been a High Commissioner or an Ambassador than in Canada during COVID. I want to thank all my colleagues and friends in the Canadian Civil Service for the support they've given me and my team in confronting it. Finally, um, enjoy your discussion today. Uh, you'll be laughing out loud at some of this because what's true in the UK is very definitely true in Canada. Uh, and uh, I am sure that you will discover hidden gems to add to the ones I've already given you today. Thanks. I'm Pierre Pettigrew. I'm Executive Advisor International at uh, Deloitte, Deloitte Canada, and now based in Toronto. I'm also Chairman of the Asia Pacific Foundation of Canada. And in the, in the earlier life, I was a minister in the governments of uh, Chrétien and Martin between 1996 and 2006, uh, mostly Minister of Human Resources Development. Minister for International Trade and uh, Foreign Minister in the end. Hi, my name is Lisa Raitt. I was the Member of Parliament for Milton, Ontario from 2008 until 2019. In 2008, I was named the Minister of Natural Resources. In 2010, I was named the Minister of Labour. And in 2013, I was named the Minister of Transport. And in opposition, I was a critic for finance and I was the critic for justice as well being the Deputy Leader both in the House and for our party, the Conservative Party of Canada. Hello, my name is O'Neill Collier. I'm a regional representative for the Public Service Alliance of Canada in the Edmonton Regional Office of the PSAC. I've been involved with PSAC since I was 19 years old as a technician with Agriculture Canada, but I took a four year gap. In 2015, I was elected as a member of the Legislative Assembly for White Court St. Anne, and then was appointed as the Minister of Agriculture and Forestry for Alberta under the Notley government. I'm uh, Bruce Hollett. Uh, I am a retired uh, public servant in Newfoundland and Labrador, a uh, career of about 38, a little over 38 years, 22 of those as uh, you know, a deputy minister and or a uh, public entity CEO uh, in a number of different uh, organizations and a number of different uh, departments. Uh, so it was pretty interesting uh, and long career. Retired uh, about five months now and uh, you know, loving every minute of that too. I'm Carl Salgo. I'm uh, Executive Director of Public Governance at the Institute on Governance, but uh, I am uh, a career, a retired career public service a, a servant. I was in the public service for um, uh, about 25 years, mostly in central agencies of the Government of Canada, uh, Finance Canada, uh, and for uh, many years in the Privy Council office, essentially the Cabinet office, and uh, where I was uh, Director of Operations for the Machinery of Government uh, Secretariat. 
My name is Andrea Lancier Seymour. I am uh, currently the Director of Public Information and Media Relations at the City of Ottawa, which is the external communications function at the uh, administrative level for the city. So in past lives, uh, I was a reporter and I was a uh, communications assistant for a city councillor. And I was, of course, also on the Hill. I worked as press secretary for the Minister of International Trade. I suggest that it should be government policy to designate a road haulage as its own principal means of freight transport. If I might crave your indulgence for a moment, Minister, I think that such a policy would be, not to put too fine a point on it, unacceptably short-sighted. It is rail transport that must surely be the favoured carrier under any sane national policy. With the greatest possible respect, I have to say that both those proposals are formulae for disaster. Long-term considerations absolutely mandate the increase of air freight to meet rising oh. demands. Of course, if the minister is prepared for a massive budget increase... If the minister will accept a long and unbelievably bitter national rail strike... If the minister can tolerate a massive rise in public discontent... <laughs> Hold on. <laughs> Look, we are the government, aren't we? Indeed you are, minister. So we're <laughs> all on the same side. No, right. of course yes, we are. No question. Trying to do what's best for Britain. I hardly think that the end of the national air freight business is best for Britain. I find it hard to see how Britain is served by the destruction of the railways. It is not immediately apparent how Britain benefits from a rapid deterioration of the road network. I just wanted to examine a few policy options for the government's own freight transport needs. I thought a preliminary discussion, a, a few friends around the table, a few constructive... Positive suggestions? Well, of course, an expansion of rail transport. An expansion of motorway construction? An expansion of air freight capacity. But my brief is to achieve an overall reduction in costs, you see. Ah, well, in that case, there is only one possible course. Indeed, there is. And there can be no doubt what it is. Good. I always like to end on a note of agreement. Thank you, gentlemen. <laughs> Well, I think I was lucky enough in my years to have deputy ministers who would sort of orchestrate better that kind of meeting. I had similar meetings when I was meeting outside the government. When you bring in the, uh, those, for instance, as trade minister who, who love trade and those who are resisting and need protection and that, that kind of thing I would do in consultation outside of the government. But within the government, I was lucky enough that they got their act together before they came to me for any kind of uh, policy decision. You're sitting down with your minister, uh, you know, or with Premier or, or uh, whoever to have a uh, discussion about some of that, you know, uh, you do your homework, you know, you have that, you know, you have those discussions before you go sit with the minister and have a chat about it. Typically, you know, you should know on, on any significant issue, you know, you really should know what the overall policy direction or likely policy direction of the government or the minister is and going prepared to talk about that and you know how you can support that not with uh, you know uh, you know a bunch of wildly different uh you know approaches to uh, to an issue you know uh, not that it never happens that was very typical of what could happen in a ministerial briefing i have to say so i was the minister of transport and i it's very clever that they picked up on the fact that even within a department, there's always going to be those factors or those factions that are, are, you know, they rub up against one another. Which is more important? Is it air? Is it, I'm surprised that they didn't mention marine. We had marine as well. Is it road, air, marine? Is it rail? And I always wondered when I was the CEO of the Toronto Port Authority, why was it certain ministers would always fall in love with a certain mode of transport? And that's what ended up happening in all of their attention would go into it. So what happens when I get to be the Minister of Transport? I end up having to focus on one mode of transport and um, it was rail. You will have competing interests, but usually not from public servants, would be from stakeholders from the different industries. They're almost lobbyists in this scene. Uh, that doesn't happen. That doesn't happen in Canada. The lobbying is done by the lobbyists and the best lobbyists are the CEOs of the airlines and the rail companies and the shipping companies, for sure. I find that the uh, officials in Canada aren't as, I would say, overt in what their preference is. It's a little bit more subtle. The arguments are always cast as they do there in terms of the public interest. We saw uh, some of the funnier struggles was actually when people were trying to avoid responsibility um, for something. Uh, I, I quite distinctly remember uh, gifts 
two prime ministers uh, uh, that could not be kept uh, because they were above a certain amount and uh, different um, organizations. We had a, a conference call, one actually that involved the prime minister's wife on one occasion, um, in which each organization was trying to explain why it should not have responsibility for this. So it was almost like that discussion um, in reverse. Probably the right thing to do for the, the for the deputy there to uh, signal a quick exit. It was kind of a funny way he did the exit, you know, but, uh, you know, okay, let's get out of here, uh, you know. His, his aide ushering everybody out of the room saying, okay, reach for agreement is pretty much true to life. Shut the meeting down, close your books, and say, okay, gotta go because meetings, you know, there'll be another nine lined up for that day. And the, the cry at the end of the minister saying, can't we all just get along? No, it doesn't happen that way at all. No. Five standard excuses. Yeah. First, there's the excuse we used, for instance, in the Anthony Blunt case. Yes, which was? Uh, that there's a perfectly satisfactory explanation for everything, but security forbids its disclosure. Second, there's the excuse we use for comprehensive schools, that it only went wrong because of heavy cuts in staff and budget, which stretched supervisory resources beyond their limits. But that's not true, is it? No, it's a good excuse. <laughs> then there's the excuse we use for Concord. It was a worthwhile experiment, now abandoned, but not before it had provided much valuable data and considerable employment. But that is true, isn't it? Oh, no, of course it isn't. <laughs> the four. There's the excuse we used for the Munich Agreement. It occurred before certain important facts were known and couldn't happen again. What important facts? Well, that Hitler wanted to conquer Europe. <laughs> I thought everybody knew that. Not the Foreign Office. <laughs> five? Uh, five. There's the charge of the Light Brigade excuse. It was an unfortunate lapse by an individual which has now been dealt with under internal disciplinary procedures. <laughs> and that covers everything? Well, just about everything so far. <laughs> Even wars? Yeah, small wars. The, the, the use of sort of uh, stock uh, sort of responses, not word for word, but uh, the gist of it, I find that actually quite resonant myself. All of these have been used, I can tell you that. These are very good cop-outs, I find. And as I said, I probably use all of them over my 10 years. Obviously, you know that they are excuses, but sometimes there are certain things you have to be truthful to the house and you have to do, however, you cannot be too comprehensive on your answer. Standard excuses or procedure. I don't, I don't know if it'd be actually ex excuses in my own department. Um, you know, over 2,000 people that were well-trained, that were experts on a particular thing. And there was no, absolutely nothing wrong, I don't think, with talking to reporters at least saying that, you know, we're, that's a very good question, we're still researching it, we're looking into it. So there are always some standard ways to answer questions. I never would sit down, we wouldn't have talked about a list of, of excuses, but we had certainly talked about, you know, uh, you know, many, in many occasions, you know, about messages that you do want to get out, how you, you know, stay on message and get to the message you really want to get out you know, as opposed to necessarily directly answering the question. Stay on message. You know, that's really, you know, what that discussion, you know, in the real world is really about, you know. I don't think that we have a set number of excuses, but I will say that politicians and policy people are driven to put something in a process when they don't have an actual answer. Well, we don't call it excuses in the comms business. We you have media lines or key messages. So every morning, as many of you probably know, we would have our morning meeting where we uh, look at all of the issues on, uh, you know, that have been in the media, wherever it might be and what might come up in the House of Commons. And we would come up with answers for everything, working with the department. Um, not excuses, but, um, you know, oftentimes you'd hear the joke, well, it is question period, it's not answer period. Question period is often described as as a you know a question period, not necessarily an answer period, and you got only seconds to ask a question, and only seconds to to, to answer those questions. Uh, at the city, um, you know, I laughed at the security uh, portion of it, saying that that's the we can't speak about it because of security. Um, oftentimes, we actually can't, and I know that the perception is that we're uh, we're avoiding it. So it's almost like, well, what can we say? So it doesn't look like we're using that as an excuse. In the house, a little bit different. Your opposition or the opposite party would be asking you questions on on something, and they and they they want to get you 
right? There was a little gotcha moment about trying to get you off guard. Um, but, but, and then you, you might have to spin, you might have to spin and saying, well, it's a really good question. And this is what the government is doing. I'm making something, making something good, trying to put the best light on, light on things. One of the things that uh, a politician will do is that they will set up advisory committees. You will consult wide and far in order to bring in the most um, pertinent information and the best experts to give you advice along the way. Mind, mind you, in the back room, there's about 15 officials in a secretariat who are actually drafting up what is going to be the position of the government going forward. Yes, it's important what experts come in and tell you, but it actually only adds the color to what is actually probably already decided from a policy point of view when it comes to the department doing the work on it already. Not saying that your time is invaluable as an outside expert, sometimes this stuff does work, but uh, the reality is, is that a lot of this stuff has already been baked in. Your approval for this local government allowances amendment number two for this year's regulations. What is it? It's a statutory instrument to be laid before the House as Minister responsible for local government. We need you to authorise that the revised paragraph 5 of number 2 regulation 1971 shall come into operation on March the 18th next. Revoking regulation 7 of the local government allowances amendment regulations 1954B. <laughs> Hell does all that mean? It's all right, there is an explanatory note, Minister. <laughs> These regulations are to make provision for prescribing the amounts of attendance and financial loss allowances payable to members of local authorities. Explanatory note, Regulation 3 of the Local Government Allowances Amendment Regulations 1971, the 1971 regulations, substituted a new regulation for Regulation 3 of the 1954 regulations. <laughs> regulation 3 of the Local Government Allowances Amendment Regulations 1972, the 1972 regulations, further made amends Regulation 3 of the 1954 regulations by increasing the maximum rates of attendance and financial loss allowances. Regulation 7 of the 1982 regulations revoked both Regulations 3 and 5 of the 1971 regulations. Regulation 5 being a regulation revoking earlier spent regulations. <laughs> With effect from 1st of April next. These regulations preserve Regulations 3 and 5 of the 1971 regulations by revoking Regulation 7 of the 1972 regulations. <laughs> And that's an explanatory note? <laughs> well, yes, Minister, I think that's all quite clear. Ministers must feel that way um, all the time, that they're bombarded with, you know, technical ja jargon. Um, and, and uh, you know, they, they, they don't know what it is uh, they're actually doing from time to time. Um, so, yeah, I, I can relate to that, you know, not knowing what... Uh what anything is sometimes in a conversation and not want to be that stupid person around the table that's going, what is that? But then when the brave person does speak out and ask what that acronym is, is everyone in the room is very thankful because uh, they didn't have to be the one to ask. Uh, someone I used to work with said, we need to ban acronyms as a society because nobody knows what it means. One thing that I forbade all of my years as a minister was uh, acronyms. I have always been very bad at acronyms and my officials in the written briefing were instructed never to use them. And the minute there was an acronym that was not explained, I would stop reading, send it back to the uh, machine so that they could not get the decision that they wanted because I would just stop reading whenever there was an acronym I couldn't understand. You know, people have to, you know, get their minister's approval on what, man, you got to find a better way to, to explain it to them than that. Find a simple way to explain it to your minister. Clearly, the minister was, uh, you know, sort of baffled by what was going on. And, you know, that's not necessarily, uh, you know, all that uh, unrealistic in some of these, you know, highly regulatory environments. I mean, I was deputy minister of environment for a while. And, you know, we had some, you know, horrendously complicated uh, you know, environmental issues and environmental files. I mean, you could get absolutely, totally, you know, uh, overwhelmed, uh, if you would, uh, you know, by the complexity of, of, you know, the regulatory framework that you had to get your way through and that you had to get the minister's approval and the minister's sign off. When I got that kind of uh, briefing where I didn't understand a thing, but you don't want to look to the optic like, to this minister, I would just say, uh, yeah, now bring me a one pager. Bring me a one pager in, uh, in a language that I can understand. Yes, minister, it's all quite clear. 
so what this is showing you is there's a whole different language that's happening up there in Ottawa or probably in any legislature across the country. And I could actually follow what that guy was talking about, quite frankly, because he's just going through the iteration of how many times the law has been amended or the regulations been amended. And he's trying to explain something like that, something very technical like that. It would certainly be um, the subject of, of a, a memorandum, certainly in our system um, uh, in Canada and uh, and authorization would uh, would be, uh, you know, in writing. But again, yes, Minister, I can't deal with things that way. It has to deal with things verbally because you're, you're watching it, right? You can't show documents. I honestly don't think um, public servants quite uh, uh, I, I manipulate ministers quite to that extent. I never found that um, bureaucrats or officials within the department would try to come in and snow the minister. Look, there are two types of ministers. Those are, there are the ones that run their department and there are the ones that are run by their department. And pretty early on in the process, you want to kind of assert which one you're going to be. Paul Martin used to talk about the GDP deflator crowd, um, the people who would talk uh, in, in technical language about, uh, about different things and throw that at you. Um, and I remember him once getting very mad at uh, an official um, who uh, started to quote uh, some figures. And he said, those are very different figures than you quoted from me last week. Oh, yes, yes, minister, but we changed our model. Um, but in a little bit of the don't worry your uh, ministerial head about that, uh, we just changed our model. And uh, th that, that particular minister getting quite angry. <laughs> Even in yes, minister, there's a relative progression, right? So, so uh, the minister is uh, a little bit uh, more lost at the beginning. At the end, he starts to come into his own, right? And uh, he occasionally gets the better of Sir Humphrey. As long as we can head him off this open government nonsense. But I thought we were calling the white paper open government. Yes, well, always disposed of the difficult bit in the title. There's less harm there than in the text. <laughs> the more of inverse relevance, the less you intend to do about something, the more you have to keep talking about it. Uh, but uh, <laughs> what's wrong with open government? I mean, why shouldn't the public know more about what's going on? Are you serious? <laughs> Well, uh, yes, sir. I mean, it is the minister's policy, after all. My dear boy, it's a contradiction in terms. You can be open, or you can have government. But... <laughs> but surely the citizens of a democracy have a right to know. No. They have a right to be ignorant. <laughs> Knowledge only means complicity and guilt. Ignorance has a certain dignity. But if the minister wants open government... You don't just give people what they want if it's not good for them. Do you give... Brandy to an alcoholic. Oh, uh, if people don't know what you're doing, they don't know what you're doing wrong. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm sorry, Sir Humphrey. I am the minister's private secretary, and if that's what he wants... My then... dear fellow, you will not be serving your minister by helping him to make a fool of himself. Look at the ministers we've had. Every one of them would have been a laughing stock in three months had it not been for the most rigid and impenetrable secrecy about what they were up to. <laughs> what are you supposed to do about it? Can you keep a secret? Of course. So can I. Keeping things from the public or, or keeping things even from the minister. There is, I think, a little tiny bit of truth to that. I don't quite believe that you can have open or you can have government, but government has to manage its messages sometimes. So my experience is that if you don't do that, um, uh, you, you do get eaten alive and, it, and it's hard to get your agenda realized. I have seen that in real life, that if you don't make sure that they're, you're singing from the, the same uh, song sheet in broad terms, um, the only outcome, it, it, you know, ends up being embarrassment because there is supposed to be cabinet solidarity. Cabinet is supposed to speak with a single voice. One thing you'll always remember and that you inform your staff of is be prepared for any email that you write to be featured on the front page of the Globe and Mail, Toronto Star, Toronto Sun, whatever your newspaper is across the country, and uh, be able to defend it. And in other words, uh, when you're communicating, even if it's in emails, even if it's in, in a letter form, um, know that that could possibly see the light of day one day. People do have a right to, uh, to, to have a lot of information and to be able to ask questions and get answers and be able to get information. At the same time, that doesn't mean that, uh, you know, governments are, uh, 
are not continuously, uh, you know, trying to, you know, manage the message. You know, in some cases, what, what happens is that, uh, you know, things do not necessarily get committed to paper, uh, you know, anymore or, or in briefing notes, uh, et cetera, in the same way that they might have been, uh, you know, 25 years ago, uh, you know, when there would be detailed policy option papers done on a lot of things prior to email and texting and everything else, you know, you did one of two things. You either spoke to people in person uh, in meetings or you wrote letters, uh, you know, and, and or you wrote briefing notes. And, you know, in a lot of cases, you know, things would be, uh, you know, very well, uh, you know, very well thought out and thought through prior to, you know, signing your name on a briefing note or signing your name on a, a letter or a memo. And, uh, you know, but, you know, the world of, of uh, you know, text and email is, you know, is much more instantaneous, both in expectation of response, uh, you know, on both parties. You know, I mean, if I, if I text somebody as a, as a deputy minister asking them a question, you know, I expect an answer really within minutes. Then you've got the whole business of, uh, you know, the open government stuff, uh, you know, requiring that, you know, anybody who wants access to anything can have access to it, you know, if it is, if it is government business. The attitudes, you know, shown in that clip, uh, you know, were, you know, in a humorous way, you know, sort of reflective of, of the real discussion that goes and the real thought that goes on, uh, you know, goes goes behind that this is really something i have experienced when i was trade minister and uh, leading the negotiations of the free trade area of the americas i embarked on the crusade to make the negotiating text public that had never been done and i was told by my trade negotiators in the department no 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 it's impossible and the other countries will not accept it and I said, we should have the negotiating text public so that we get the uh, income and the feedback. And there are so many rumors of things that people believe we are negotiating and that we are not. Anyway, I embarked on that crusade to get the negotiating text of the free trade area of the Americas. Uh, my officials supported me very much in my crusade touring the Americas, and we got it. But some of the trade negotiators in the department were really not pleased with me and pushed back as hard as they could and uh, always said that it was impossible that, that of the 34 countries of the Americas. And that's one of the nicest moments in, in my life is when we arrived at the Mar, de, Mar del Plata in Argentina and that the 34 countries accepted to make public the negotiating texts of the uh, free trade area of the Americas. I was quite, quite, quite pleased with that, but the whole, whole thing about it. So I'm telling ministers, insist on open. It's, it's, it works. It's good. <laughs> you know, there's been a lot of debate on how, you know, public debate on how the public can learn more about how things work at the government. And it is actually a huge focus right now, particularly looking you know, at the technology that we have. How do we engage people early on in the process? Because counter to what's said there, um, when people are surprised at the end of the process versus being in the loop at the beginning of the process or, you know, throughout, um, it makes it so much harder, you know, the, uh, whether it's um, because it becomes a big controversy because people weren't aware or it wasn't done the way that people were expecting, you end up spending so much more time fixing the problem than just to bring people in in the beginning. So uh, I feel like I'm that, that bewildered guy in the corner thing, but of course we need open government um, because uh, you know, that uh, just makes it easier for everybody in the end. I think open government is, is something that people strive for to what extent. I think it you know, depends a lot on the government and the style of the government. Um, the public servants, being a public servant myself, there were things that were um, not necessarily uh, advertised that would not would I, I guess say contradict you know perhaps a policy or a previous policy uh, of things that are still being ironed out. Again, government has so many moving parts that to to mesh these moving parts, these gears together, uh, can take some finesse and can take a lot of uh, frankly professional public servants to to guide the ministers as they go forward. Well, even though we've been doing it open government and saying we have open government, uh, you know, for quite some time, and people are so really struggling with, with what it really means, you know, and how open we really are. Uh, you know, certainly we're a lot more open, uh, you know, in, in the public sector than, than we were a uh, year, you know, decades ago, but uh, still a lot of work to do on that. 
Oh, well, you asked me to find out about that alleged empty hospital in North London. Oh, yes. Uh, well, as I warned you, Minister, the driver's network is not wholly reliable. Uh, Roy has got it wrong. Thank heavens for that. How did you find out? Uh, through the uh, private secretary's network. <laughs> <laughs> and? Uh, well, in fact, there are only 342 administrative staff at the New St. Edward's Hospital. The other 170 are porters, cleaners, laundry workers, gardeners, cooks, and so forth. And how many medical staff? Oh, uh, none of them. <laughs> None? No. But uh, we are talking about St. Edward's Hospital, aren't we? Yes, it's brand new. It was completed 15 months ago and fully staffed. But unfortunately, at that time, there were government cutbacks, so consequently there was no money left for medical services. A brand new hospital with over 500 non-medical staff and no patients? Oh, there is uh, one patient. Uh, one? Yes, the deputy chief administrator fell over a piece of scaffolding and broke his <laughs> oh, God. Thank heavens I wasn't asked about this in the house. Why hasn't it got out? Well, actually, I think it's been contrived to keep looking like a building site, and so far no one's realised it's operational. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, scaffolding, skip still there, the normal thing. The normal thing? I think I'd better go and have a look at this before the opposition does. Uh, yes, it's surprising the press haven't found out by now, isn't it? Fortunately, Bernard, most of our journalists are so incompetent that have the gravest difficulty in finding out that today is Wednesday. Uh, it's actually Thursday. <laughs> The, the minister on the clip was talking about how he was, you know, worried about questions in the house. And and you do, you try to prepare for any questions that might come up, any any issues that might have happened within your own ministry, with government in general, frankly, um, you know, and, and try to get on top of those as much as possible. And, but it's impossible. It's, there's way too many moving parts. There's uh, literally tens of thousands of people working for government. Um, but if you can capture what you can and, and prepare what you can, and otherwise it's, you know, well, that's a really good question. I'm going to get back to it. Well, again, you have, uh, you have the poor um, uh, uh, naive minister uh, expecting things to be, uh, you know, uh, run uh, in accordance with uh, uh, normal human intuition when, in fact, government has its own logic. Yeah, those, those terrible uh, stories when you are afraid that they will come out and when you get a message, you know, from from your uh, deputy minister saying, well, this may come up in the house, uh, minister, we, we wanted to brief you on this situation for a while, uh, but we haven't had the opportunity. Yeah, well, this is it. I mean, as a minister, you have sometimes to uh, get up in the house and uh, defend realities or protect the government. That's the ministerial responsibility is that even when, when we really don't do very well, you still have to get up there and try to uh, find an intelligent answer. You know, not the sort of, uh, you know, uh, information that a minister would like to be, uh, you know, sitting on, uh, you know, when they may or may not get asked by the press about it. And of course, first thing the minister is wondering about, uh, you know, is, uh, you know, how am I gonna, how am I gonna explain this one, uh, you know, if I do get a question about it. <laughs> Even though that one has to do with the media, uh, you know, my experience with the media is uh, often they would find out about these things. So I think, uh, you know, uh, when I worked on the Hill, we had a very, uh, very strong um, beat reporters. Uh, I remember one situation where the, one of the beat reporters actually was calling and he's just fishing, you know, what something reporters do, they'll call and they'll say, hey, is anything going on with this? Um, and there was something going on with that. And we hadn't told anyone, but we were going to make an announcement in like a week or two. Oh my gosh, they know. We have to make this big announcement. We have to get out ahead of it. And I, I remember just saying, well, why don't we just call him and actually ask him what he wants? Because I know as a reporter, that's the exact tactic I would take. So we called and asked the reporter, hey, uh, you know, what do you need to know? And it was, oh, nothing. I was checking in. I hadn't checked in for a while. So the temperature in the room went down and uh, we were good. So then we were able to you know, wait, make the announcement, get ahead of it without being... Uh, scooped by a, a reporter who was uh, ahead of it. So that was a good news story for us in the end. I was asked a question in the, in the house and the question had to do with how many inspectors do we have along the lines? How many Transport Canada railway inspectors do we have? Because they wanted to talk about the condition of the rail and I didn't have the number. So I said that I would come back to the house with the number. I happen to be appearing in what's called Committee of the Whole. Committee of the Whole is an opportunity for the opposition to grill a minister for four hours. Four hours I was grilled and minister transport, and it was on my birthday, just to let you know. 
And for four hours I was grilled and the NDP came at me with that question over and over again. And I just kept writing these notes to my deputy saying, for God's sake, someone has to get me the number. Like it has to be a number. There has to be a number out there. Can you just get me the number so I can go forward? I never got the number. And I don't know whether or not the press caught on to it, but it's, uh, it was one of those moments where you feel like you're, you're pushing against your own department to try to get some information out. The deputy is not necessarily being particularly helpful to the minister in coming up with suggestions on how, uh, number one, you're going to talk your way around this one, or, or number two, what is it we're actually doing or going to do about it, you know, which is really the type of thing that in the real world you would be, you know, or should be very focused on. What are we actually going to do about this? You've got to be giving them good, solid advice. I didn't hear a lot of good, solid advice there. What surprises me a little bit in this, though, is that uh, he's not fighting back more at uh, when will we close this issue? When will we, you know, move on with it? That's a bit surprising. I mean, you know, normally you push back a little bit more. And as for projects that wouldn't get done because of the, the variety and, and the almost overwhelming um, nature of the different moving parts in government, it was often hard to get, and that's and that is, I suppose, opposition's job then to these get you moments. I have seen very similar situations where you know where things either were had come to the end of their life, uh, but you know there were political reasons for not uh, necessarily you know cutting the entity completely or cutting the organization completely, and and you know there are always messages about you know. Uh, what it is you're actually, what it is you're doing there, which may be, you know, looking for, uh, you know, a new purpose for it or something else, you know. Of course, this is satirical and, uh, you know, how, how closely does it, um, does it imitate reality? Having uh, personnel who you can't get rid of, notwithstanding the fact that uh, functions aren't taking place, um, that's not utterly alien to government. You will have that kind of uh, that kind of thing. It's hitting at something uh, that does happen uh, on a different scale in real life. Let's come to the roof garden. Yes, with pleasure. <laughs> this was a part of a wide variety of, of roof insulation schemes which the government was testing in the interest of fuel economy. But 75,000 pounds? Well, it was thought that the sale of flowers and vegetable produce might offset the cost. And did it? Oh, no. Then why not abandon the garden? Well, it's there now and um, it does insulate the roof and we aren't building any more. <laughs> but you wasted 75,000 pounds. Well, it was government policy to test all proposals for fuel saving. At this fantastic waste of the taxpayers' money, you agree the money was wasted? It's not for me to comment on government policy, it's not for the minister. <laughs> Look, Sir Humphrey, whatever we ask the minister, he says is an administrative question for you. And whatever we ask you, you say is a policy question for the minister. Mm -hmm. How do you suggest we find out what's going on? Yes, 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 yes. I do see that there is a real dilemma here. In that, while it has been government policy to regard policy as the responsibility of ministers and administration as the responsibility of officials, the questions of administrative policy can cause confusion between the policy of administration and the administration of policy. Especially when responsibility for the administration of the policy of administration conflicts or overlaps with responsibility for the policy of the administration of policy. <laughs> Well, that's a load of meaningless dribble, isn't it? It's not for me to comment on government policy and the minister. <laughs> One of the litmus tests of whether you're a true public servant is whether the distinction between the policy of administration and the administration of policy makes perfect sense to you, uh, which, uh, you know, I'm listening there and say, yeah, yeah, that, that's sort of, yes, yes, he's making a perfectly viable distinction. Uh, <laughs> that, that, that's very good and really goes to the heart of the relationship between the minister and the deputy minister. The questions that might have been tough for that particular deputy minister in this clip uh, were, were valid questions and, and 
I, a pat answer to not answer to ask, not answer on questions of policy is is pretty true to life. Stay away from commenting on government policy. Now, you know, I mean, all you had to do was look at his facial expressions and see that he was, you know, in effect commenting on government policy. So, uh, you know, you can't be quite that coy. Uh, or you know that clever when you're when you're answering those questions. It's not for the uh, you know for the deputy to comment on government policy, but simply to give uh, you know uh, direct answers to uh, you know uh, to specific questions when you're in, in a committee like that. I'm just telling you what government policy is, and I'm telling you the rationale for it. I'm not taking ownership of it, um, and uh, I will account to you, or rather, answer to you for how I administer my, my department and how we run things that way. What does not come out, of course, is the extent to which um, ministerial policies are based on public service advice uh, and actually are often the creatures of a public servant, as per all the other um, uh, Yes Minister episodes where you realize it, it's the, the, the public servants have played a pretty big role in shaping um, what minister's policy actually is. Mr. Humphrey kind of tries to baffle Gab, the, uh, the, the politician who's asking the questions there. And, and in my experience, I never found that to be the case with our officials. I found that they would be circumspect in how much information they would give, but they would never, you know, in a very upfront kind of way, try to actually um, not give the answer to the person who's asking the question. The adage is that you advise fearlessly and you implement faithfully. That's what the officials say in Ottawa. And for the public service, it's it's a very good motto. And it's the very truth that once a political decision is made, it is for the for the apparatus to actually implement it. And it's for the minister to answer to it. Whenever I got a, a, a new portfolio with the new deputy ministers, I always like to sit down with my deputy minister and say, well, listen, this is great. I love being a minister. I, I run for office, I get elected, and we form the government. So I will, I will govern and give the direction for the department, but I trust you to manage the department. You run the department and, you know, anything I can do to help you run the department and make sure it goes places, I'll support that. But between the administration and, and, and the politics, if you want, there is a fine line that time and again, you have to walk with your deputy ministers. And I find that the, 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 the strong relationship and the quality of a relationship between a minister and the deputy minister is when you are on that fine line between government and managing the department. It's quite interesting to see in that particular committee, the deputy minister stuck having to do that rather than the minister who might have had to also to do that sort of thing when you're on the fine line. A committee, when the minister wasn't going to appear for the whole time, it would be the deputy minister who would step in to answer questions of a committee because the deputy minister, of course, has no standing in the house. However, uh, they do have the ability to answer questions in committees and oftentimes they're called upon. I don't necessarily appreciate it when I see deputy ministers being put in the limelight by their ministers and having to answer all the questions all the time. The grilling by the opposition to public servants, that, that does happen. And sometimes with just the public servants there and sometimes with the ministers there as well. We were always the view like that, uh, you know, public servants um, weren't uh, to be attacked politically by different figures, uh, you know, which she perhaps goes a little bit uh, that way. But uh, of course, you face that. The reality is people can be quite, uh, uh, quite uh, harsh. A confidential source disclosed to me that British arms are being sold to Italian red terrorist groups. I see. May I ask who this confidential source was? Humphrey, I just said it was confidential. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, I naturally assumed that meant you were going to tell me. You seem to be very worried by this information. Well, these things happen all the time. It's not our problem. <laughs> so does robbery with violence. Doesn't that worry you? No, Minister. Home office problem. <laughs> Humphrey, we are letting terrorists get hold of murderous weapons. We're not. Well, who is? Who knows? Department of Trade, Ministry of Defence, Foreign Office. We, Humphrey, the British government. Innocent lives are being set at risk by British arms in the hands of terrorists. Only Italian lives, not British lives. <laughs> with British tourists abroad. Tourists? Foreign Office problem. 
Humphrey, we have to do something. With respect, Minister, we have to do nothing. What do you mean? The sale of arms abroad is one of those areas of government that we do not examine too closely. Well, I have to, now that I know about well, it. But you could say you don't know. You're suggesting I should lie? Oh, not you, Mr. No. Well, who should lie? Sleeping dogs, Minister. <laughs> now, I'm going to raise this. Huh? No, Minister, I beg you. A basic rule of government is never look into anything you don't have to. And never set up an inquiry unless you know in advance what its findings will be. I can't believe this. We're talking about good and evil. Ah, Church of England problem. No, how about <laughs> Our problem. We are discussing right and wrong. You may be, Minister, but I'm not. It would be a serious misuse of government time. Selling arms to terrorists is wrong. Can't you see that, Humphrey? No, Minister. Either you sell arms or you don't. If you sell them, they will inevitably end up with people who have the cash to buy them. But not terrorists. Well, I suppose we could put some sort of government health warning on the rifle, but... <laughs> this gun can seriously damage your health. <laughs> it's all very well to take this lightly, Humphrey. But we cannot close our eyes to something that is as morally wrong as this. Very well, Minister. If you insist on making me discuss moral issues, may I point out to you that something is either morally wrong or it isn't. It can't be slightly morally wrong. No, don't quibble, Humphrey. Government isn't about morality. Really? What is it about, then? Stability. Keeping things going. Preventing anarchy. Stopping society. Falling to bits. Still being here tomorrow. What for? I can't <laughs> out. What is the ultimate purpose of government? If it isn't for doing good. Minister, government isn't about good and evil. It's only about order or chaos. And it's in order for Italian terrorists to get British bombs. And you don't care. It's not my job to care. That's what politicians are for. My job is to carry out government policy. Even if you think it's wrong? Well, almost all government policy is wrong. But... <laughs> Frightfully well carried out. <laughs> <laughs> Humphrey, have you ever known a civil servant to resign on a matter of principle? I should think not. What an appalling suggestion. <laughs> the first time I fully understand that you are purely committed to means and not to ends. Well, as far as I'm concerned, Minister, and all of my colleagues, there is no difference between means and ends. If you believe that, Humphrey, you will go to hell. <laughs> Minister, I had no idea you had a theological bent. <laughs> you are a moral vacuum. If you say so, Minister. It's time for your lunch appointment, Minister. You're keeping very quiet, Bernard. What would you do about all this? I would keep very quiet, Minister. <laughs> <laughs> so, Minister, may we drop this matter of the arms sales? No, we may not. I'm going to tell the Prime Minister, personally. Make an appointment for me, would you, Bernard? This is just the sort of thing that the Prime Minister wants to know about. I assure you, Minister, this is just the sort of thing the Prime Minister desperately wants not to know about. We shall see about that. <sighs> Indeed, we will. What's the matter, Bernard? Oh, nothing really, Sir Humphrey. You look unhappy. Well, I was just wondering if the Minister was right, actually. Very unlikely. What about? <laughs> <laughs> about ends and means. I mean, will I end up as a moral vacuum, too? <laughs> oh, I hope so, Bernard. <laughs> if you work hard enough. Makes me feel rather downcast. If it's our job to carry out government policies, shouldn't we believe in them? <laughs> what an extraordinary idea. <laughs> Why? Bernard, I have served 11 governments in the past... 30 years. If I'd lead in all their policies, I would have been passionately committed to keeping out of the common market and passionately committed to going into it. I would have been utterly convinced of the rightness of nationalizing steel and of denationalizing it and renationalizing it. <laughs> in capital punishment, I'd have been a fervent retentionist and an ardent abolitionist. I would have been a Keynesian and a Friedmanite, a grammar school preserver and destroyer a nationalization freak and a privatization maniac, but above all, I would have been a stark staring raving schizophrenic. I want to go back and watch this episode and see what happens when the minister goes to see the prime minister on an issue that Sir Humphrey says he doesn't want to know about. They're constantly getting information coming at them or somebody's complaining about this or complaining about that. Sure, you know, he had a confidential source who told him this and, uh, you know, I mean, I've heard that stuff 
thousands of times from the minister. They heard this from somebody, you know, and, and it's a bit of attention to, you know, you just got to try and bring them back to, or some cases, you know, you got you to gotta hunt it down. It depends on what it is. You don't operate in a vacuum, even by own piece of legislation or policies or memorandums or, or motions or whatever it might be from our own department was still discussed in a cabinet level. So you discuss with, the, with the, your colleagues in cabinet about those policies. So you wouldn't necessarily discussing with your deputy minister about a policy or something that was not part of your portfolio. Your political staff, your chief of staff, your ministerial assistants, things, those are the people you're, you're going to discuss that with. You wouldn't be discussing with the deputy minister. You would be discussing something very, very specific to your own portfolio. The change in the ideas are wonderful. They, they, of course, they have to be rooted in um, realities of what's doable. And yeah, I've seen ministers come aboard with um, ideas that, uh, you know, had to be pushed back. It's a challenge because, again, you've, you've got very limited means, you know, the tax base, basically. What do you do to, to fill this, this void of this need that you've seen if it's not in your area of responsibility? As long as you just got to keep them focused and, and the you know, on, on what the real issue is or what the issue is, you know, they need to focus on to do well in their job. Some ministers are very challenging because they're way too engaged, uh, and, you know, in, in some areas. And some ministers are very challenged because they're just not engaged enough. But once government decides, that's it. It's your job to, uh, you know, to do your best to, uh, to implement that direction. Whether or not you personally think that it's, you know, uh, the right direction or not, that's not important. It's not that there aren't public service values. There are actually. But the kind of value side, what's the public good and public interest, that is what uh, elected officials are supposed to supply. So that give and take between um, a certain kind of idealism and desire to do something uh, versus uh, some stark practical realities, that's absolutely true. The starkness of the moral dilemma here, um, I, I, I think better of the public service than to think that they're utterly indifferent. The public service is, it plays a professional role. It's supposed to, it's supposed to um, bring its best professional advice, bring its knowledge to bear on things. In some respects, you're seeing a, a struggle between people who have different roles in the system. How do you work with one another? Uh, build these relationships, build these partners, because in the end, you all have the same citizen, the same resident that you're serving. And it's about how do we best meet their needs. It's good that we don't have a politicized, uh, a politicized place. And that's what makes us different from the United States. I mean, the anecdote that I remember is when, when the people left the White House, when the staff left the White House in the United States after, after Clinton, they took all the W's so that George W. Bush could not, they couldn't type his name. On the, on the typewriters and on the computers. I found it really um, disappointing when Global Affairs Canada, at the first time the Prime Minister, current Prime Minister, went to Global Affairs Canada after um, uh, uh, Prime Minister Harper was defeated, that they gave him a rounding um, applause. I, I don't think that was appropriate. I think that in a way, politicians, we have it easier on that side in the sense that we normally take a position and go on, it's probably more challenging for officials when you have a change of government on that one. But at the same time, I've always been impressed by the flexibility of the, uh, of, of, of the departments to organize themselves in a way that they can keep their enthusiasm by supporting the government policies, by putting individuals in different positions. The best thing a government can give you is stability. Stability of your economy, stability of the rule of law, stability of your foreign relations, stability all over the place. And let the rest of the country do what they need to do and take the risks that they need to take. Activist governments are interesting and they're happening all around the world, but it is a, it is a story that we don't know the ending to it yet. And we're going to find out. Oh, I've always been a great fan of Yes Minister. It is, it is so well done a show. And when I was a trade minister leading the uh, Canadian delegation to the ministerial WTO meeting in Doha, which was weeks after 9-11, lots of nervousness in the air, particularly to go in that region. So we had chartered a uh, military plane to bring the delegation to Doha in those circumstances. And on those uh, military planes, I had, of course, the, 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 the political staff team, my 
trade team from the Department of International Trade, representatives of finance and all of the people, and some members from business who were coming to see what we were doing. And I presented, uh, in those military planes, there was only one show, like in the old commercial planes at the time, and I imposed on the whole team to watch Yes Ministers throughout the ride. So we had yes ministers, and as you see in one yes minister, the minister looks good, and the other, the officials look good. And it was funny, we all laughed a lot, not all at the same time, but we all enjoyed the ride. <laughs> so the series is, is, is in some ways, it, the popular public servants, is, is a little bit a minister's perception, um, and the popular perception that you can't get done what you want to get done because an establishment within the bureaucracy um, has vested interests in keeping things the way they are. Much as I love the series, I actually take issue with that basic uh, uh, scenario. Um, I actually believe that the pu most public servants are there to see that, uh, uh, you know, good things happen. They are actually very responsive to ministers in policy. Um, again, where I find um, uh, there's real truth is that um, you know, uh, how government is done, public servants are often un, un self consciously wedded to the way governments have been done. Talking to them about, um, you know, their culture <clears throat> is a little like talking to fish about water, um, they, as opposed to what. Uh, that's, that's what they know, and they, a lot of things they take as a given. I actually do think there is a lot of institutional resistance to change in the how. Um, in, this, in the policy, um, I think actually the series is, uh, is uh, for, for all its humor, um, actually distorts the extent to which um, there's any opposition. I really don't, I really think for the most part, uh, public servants are just trying to um, acquaint ministers with the uh, un foreseen and unforeseen consequences of some of their, their actions. And it may seem like obstructionism.